to join. I'm just going to give it one more second as everybody files into the webinar before we begin. All right. Hello and welcome to a conversation with Dr. Jeffrey C. Stewart, a special event in celebration of the Fulbright Program's 75th anniversary. My name is Christopher Mazikane, and I'm a project manager on the Fulbright Program at the Institute of International Education, as well as a proud Fulbright alumnus. To kick off today's event, I'd like to welcome Deneo Brinson from the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. Deneo? Good afternoon. My name is Deneo Brinson, and I'm very pleased uh, that my role this afternoon is to welcome you on behalf of the U.S. Department of State. I'm an academic exchange specialist in what is commonly known as the Fulbright Office in the U.S. Department of State Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. We're thrilled to host this afternoon's event, which provides us all with an exciting opportunity to engage with Dr. Jeffrey Stewart in a conversation about his critically important and award-winning work, The New Negro, The Life of Alan Locke, and Harlem Renaissance Movement, the Harlem Renaissance Movement that he truly inspired. This program today is being sponsored by the Fulbright Program, the flagship international academic exchange program sponsored by the US government. Fulbright has fostered uh, mutual understanding and helped to build bridges between the people of the United States and the people of other countries since 1946. Funding for the program is provided by the U.S. government and the U.S. Congress through an, an annual appropriation, excuse me, by partner governments, by the private sector, and from individual donors and institutions of higher education in the United States and across the world. Several U.S. nonprofit organizations administer components of the Fulbright Program on behalf of the State Department, including the Institute for International Education, better known as IIE, and we thank IIE for organizing this panel today. 2021 marks the 75th anniversary of the Fulbright Program. Events are being hosted all year long in the U.S. and all around the world to commemorate Fulbright's anniversary. I'm proud that today's exploration of the life and work of Dr. Alan Locke is part of Fulbright's 75th anniversary celebration. I'm very proud to acknowledge that today's panel is taking place during Black History Month, highlighting and supporting diversity and inclusion in all of its forms within the Fulbright program uh, is one of our overarching priorities and very important to us and will continue to be highlighted during this anniversary year and far beyond. We'll be hosting activities and events throughout the year to encourage you, uh, and we encourage you to visit our dedicated website, fulbright75.org, where you will find stories about Fulbright alumni making a difference. You can check out our upcoming events calendar and sign up for our newsletter. I'm eager to get this afternoon's conversation going, which features two such Fulbright alumni who have made an impact through their work. We thank our moderator, Dr. Joanne Braxton, for leading our discussion today. And we thank Dr. Stewart for taking the time out of his busy schedule to be with us today. Dr. Joanne Braxton, Dr. Stewart, you've committed to a life of intellectual curiosity and excellence in academia and have led by example. We look forward to your conversation and we thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Deneo. It is now my distinct honor to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Jeffrey C. Stewart. Dr. Stewart is the author of The New Negro, The Life of Alan Locke, one of the few books of history to win both the National Book Award for Nonfiction and the Pulitzer Prize for Biography. A graduate of Yale University, Dr. Stewart now serves as Professor of Black Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara, after numerous fellowships, lectureships, and professorships including a year at Roma Trey University, where he was a Fulbright lecturer in American studies. For his next project, Dr. Stewart is partnering with the Museum of the City of New York for a special four-part seminar called Revisiting the Harlem Renaissance, which will take an even deeper dive into the themes of his award-winning book. 
please join me in welcoming Dr. Jeffrey C. Stewart. Thank you so much, Christopher, and uh, everyone at the Fulbright Commission, uh, Basim Abbasi, Claire Stomber, uh, and especially uh, Danae O'Brinson for making this uh, event possible and giving me an opportunity, you know, to come back and think about Fulbright and within the context of my biography of Alan Locke. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to share screen now and uh, show you a few slides to illustrate some of the points that I wanna make in this brief uh, presentation. Uh, you know, it's one of those things that's particularly great to be reunited uh, with a colleague. And so I'm so happy that uh, Dr. Joanne Braxton has agreed to come and be in conversation with me. It's not only because I so highly esteem her, but also we share a common past, a common mentor, uh, the late uh, Yale professor of history, John Blassingame, who was at Yale when I was a graduate student there, as well as uh, Dr. Braxton. And, you know, he's an underappreciated uh, giant in American history who carved out a tremendous body of work in the history of slavery, but also did something else. He mentored a lot of young African-American and European-American students uh, in the 70s and 80s at a time when, you know, a lot of other people wouldn't uh, necessarily reach out to us. So I just wanted to call his name and thank him because without him, I wouldn't be here because without him, I wouldn't have known about Alan Locke. He was the one who introduced me to this topic and this man. So thank you, John. Thank you so much. Of course, we are here to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the Fulbright program, which was the brainchild of J. William Fulbright, uh, the junior senator from Arkansas who launched this program in 1946 to allow students and scholars from the United States and the world to travel outside of their country of origin, uh, to have experiences that were both scholarly and social and emotional. That was kind of his answer, a kind of cosmopolitan answer to the Cold War. After all, you know, the Cold War was a time of heated conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union. And he wanted to interdict that tendency, which was epitomized uh, uh, by people like uh, Joe McCarthy and others, uh, to isolate Americans, uh, to isolate us from influences from abroad. So we thank him because it took not only just vision, but a certain amount of skill to institutionalize a program and keep it going so that it is here today. And so it was there for me to be able to leave Washington DC in 2003 and spend the spring semester in Italy uh, at the University of Rome Dre, teaching courses in American intellectual history and the Harlem Renaissance uh, to you know, Italian undergraduates and graduate students in American studies who I'm pretty sure had never had a black teacher before in their lives. So, uh, you know, it was one of those special kind of moments in my life. And it was more than just teaching abroad because for some of us who are professors who get the Fulbright, it's sort of an opportunity to escape, you know, escape all of the entanglements that uh, descend on you when you're a professor at a university. At that time, I was at George Mason University. You know, the committee meetings, uh, uh, teaching subjects maybe that you don't want. Uh, it's an opportunity to step outside that frame and to grow and expand, enlarge. And for me in particular, to return to thinking about the Locke book in a way that I had, and I kind of lost uh, touch with it in a way, uh, becoming a professor. And um, I had also been somewhat defined a little bit in 2003 by the fact that I hadn't completed the biography. I've been working on it many years, 
and uh, you know, I kind of lost my touch with it, my connection with it. And so being outside of the country, being in Italy that, that semester was really very important for me to kind of get back to who I was. And so I thank the Fulbright uh, program uh, for that. Uh, and it, it, it's just an incredible experience for me. Now, before going on, tell you more about this, I have to pause again and uh, thank Marion Deshmukh, who's on the left here, uh, who was a former chair of the Department of History at uh, George Mason, who's gone on to eternity, uh, like Locke and Fulbright. Uh, but she was one of the best people I've met on earth. I mean, her enthusiasm, her infectious laughter, but also her generosity to reach out to me when the initial call had kind of come to her because she was in intellectual history. And she said, no, no, I think Jeffrey would be good for this. Uh, I, and promoted me and advanced me. She really made it uh, possible. Uh, so she's really uh, the, the reason that I was able to get to Rome where I met incredibly welcoming and supportive Rome Trey, professor and chair of the Department of American Studies, uh, Christina Giacelli. Uh, and in going abroad, I was following in Locke's footsteps, you see, because in 1907, many years earlier, he became the first African-American to be selected as Rhodes Scholar to Oxford. But he came to Europe with quite a different agenda and entered a quite different world uh, from mine. Now, you might be saying, well, who is this guy? Who is Alan Locke? Well, he was born in 1885 in Philadelphia uh, to a middle-class African-American family that taught him that culture with the capital C was the path of deliverance in a world in which Black people in the early 20th century were hounded by racism and abuse. Uh, Locke was probably most famous though as being called the father of the Harlem Renaissance, the Black literary uh, movement of the 1920s that advanced artists like uh, Langston Hughes and uh, you know people like County Cullen, Zora Neale Hurston, who's probably the most well-remembered person today, but also actors and singers like uh, Paul Rowe and uh, Roland Hayes, who sang the Negro spirituals, as they were called at that time, as art songs. And his whole thing that Locke was very much interested in was the idea of Black art and Black elegance, that you know, the, the Black people had a cultural and aesthetic tradition that was taking America by storm, but under-recognized and under-theorized, particularly epitomized in the jazz music that uh, became sort of the, the soundtrack of the war in 20, uh, particularly when people like Duke Ellington took over the Cotton Club in Harlem. So art was abound, it was rolling, it was people talking about it, but the thing about Locke was, he didn't see this as just simply cultural entertainment, okay? He thought of art, music, poetry, culture, modes of liberation uh, that could, if managed correctly, not only uh, change how white people looked at black people, but also change how black people looked at themselves as heirs of great transnational African civilization that had come to America as sort of unchecked baggage, Atlantic slave tree. Uh, the key factor here to remember though is this, Locke did not magically arrive at this point of view, okay? It took a long time for him to see that black agency could be articulated through aesthetics. It was a long journey and it began for him with his own Fulbright-like experience, his Fulbright-like trip to Oxford when he was selected as the first black Rhodes Scholar in 1907. Now here I want to pause again, but this time to go back to Fulbright. 
I mean, we know that Fulbright is well praised for creating the Fulbright program to counter the isolationism of the US uh, in its conflict with the Soviet Union. Uh, people like Joe McCarthy was trying to shut down, rooting out people who had any liberal ideas. And essentially, uh, Fulbright believed that study abroad would have a transformative effect on Americans, but also on other people getting to know America. And we know that Fulbright was also, like Locke, a Rhodes Scholar coming over to Oxford in 1925, 18 years after Locke, and uh, Fulbright obtained a degree uh, from Oxford, whereas Locke failed to do so. Importantly, the Oxford Rhodes Scholar experience for Fulbright created his reputation or cemented it perhaps as an American intellectual with an elite imprimatur of being a Rhodes Scholar, which is what it really was in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, but we also recall that Senator Fulbright was one of the senators from the South who called the 1954 decision of the Supreme Court, Brown versus Board of Education, the decision to desegregate public schools throughout the South, he called that a mistake. And he also organized 14 other senators to sign a Southern uh, manifesto promising resistance to the implementation of the Supreme Court's decision in the South. Now to be fair, and he later explained this, that his manifesto was more moderate and less draconian than that organized by the South Carolina Senator Strong Thurman, but it still emboldened the South to resist what was in effect uh, the decision of the highest court in the land. So I mention this to suggest that all of these figures that we look back upon and that we honor for good reason are complex figures. And so was Locke, okay? So for part of the reason that Locke wanted to go to uh, Oxford under the roads is that he wanted to escape the race problem that Senator Fulbright also had such difficulty with uh, while otherwise being sort of the epitome of the American liberal. I mean, I think that's what most people would say about uh, Fulbright, he was opposed to the Vietnam War, many other things. Locke, though, had his own, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, ghosts in the closet, okay? At Harvard, which Locke attended beforehand and which was key to him getting the Rhodes Scholarship, um, his letters home to his mother were filled with disparaging comments about the other Black students at Harvard. Some letters that even used the N-word and not in that a uh, cozy way that some black apologists uh, have defended its use among black people. Indeed, in one of his letters, which I quote uh, uh, at length in my biography, The New Delight on Lock, uh, he says to his mother that his main motivation in seeking the roads is to get to Europe and perhaps escape forever the Negro question the race problem, as it was called at the time. His embrace of what Rhodes and later Fulbright provided gifted Americans, a time abroad uh, to become a cosmopolitan and escape American uh, provincialism was for Locke also an opportunity to escape from being seen or defined or controlled or evaluated under the regime of race and racism. But tragically for Locke, but perhaps somewhat good for us, uh, 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 it didn't turn out the way he intended to be. I mean, Locke was running away in a way from something that he would ultimately have to confront. Uh, didn't like the other black students at uh, Harvard, I think, because they were a reminder of his own destiny to live, struggle, and to die under segregation. 
Interestingly, Locke died in 1954, right after the Supreme Court decision uh, was rendered that Fulbright critiqued. Locke's whole life, and this is something hard for us, I think, to recapture, his whole life in America was, was lived under the regime of segregation, you see. But the other thing is he also internalized the message of that regime, a kind of self-hatred, and he suppressed it under a kind of triumphant egotism that said, I'm better than this. I'm going to escape this by going course, he had a tremendous amount of personal power because he actually got it, okay? So what's also kind of complicated, and this is back to this complexity, is he was also something of a race man because he said that he wanted the roads also because the roads, Cecil roads, had taken so many riches out of Africa. It's almost like it was a form of reparations. Rhodes owed it to give that trust and that scholarship to a Black person. So going to Oxford was going to essentially be an escape, but also a kind of benefit, you see, from the fact that he was Black. So Locke is not an unalloyed or a hero either. But here's the kicker. Locke arrived at Oxford in all of 1907 and was deeply disappointed. Why? Because from the moment his appointment was announced, Southern Rhodes scholars were aghast and horrified. Then get it that, you know, this great honor of being a Rhodes scholar was not going to have to be shared with a black man. And they lobbied against his appointment. And then when they weren't able to get it reversed, they carried out a campaign to make his life miserable. And they succeeded in getting the Rhodes Trust people not to invite him to the Thanksgiving dinner that was held for all Americans in Oxford each November, something that wounded him deeply. And the next year, when Locke was invited to a luncheon with the American ambassador, Whitelaw Reed and his wife at their London uh, residence, uh, and he accepted the invitation, uh, Reed became hysterical when he realized that one of the Rhodes scholars was black. The head of Rhodes House at Oxford even visited Locke in his rooms and asked him to withdraw his acceptance of the invitation. He refused. Wiley then came back and asked Locke later on to provide him with a list of the Rhodes scholars he was friendly with so that he could be sat next to them at the luncheon. Locke again refused. Subsequently, an elaborate schematic of the table was created, which I think you can still find in the Rhodes archives in which they place people in different uh, positions with the Southerners seated as far away possible uh, from Locke. Uh, and Locke only hinted afterwards, he went to it, uh, he only hinted afterwards what the experience of this was like. And he said, after the Rhodes luncheon, he wrote his mother, I simply went to see Seme, Azahe Seme was his South African friend, had dinner with him, at the very next day for Paris, quote. Now that remark tells you on a very subtle level how alienated Locke had become. I mean, after two years, he had become a kind of pariah in the American community, but he found solace to a certain extent among the English, not the Americans, in part one suspects because Locke was gay. Oxford possessed a rich and thriving homosexual community that controlled Oxford's social life. While Locke dodged contact with the Rhodes Scholars, he was popular among the English. He wrote his mother, quote, sometimes I have three or four invitations a day that I have to answer. At the same time, his note to his mother about the Rhodes luncheon suggests that even that popularity was not enough to completely assuage his alienation as an American abroad. 
two ingredients in the letter, I think, uh, suggest how Locke began to work himself out intellectually from the racial cul-de-sac of being a Black American at Oxford. The first is that in 1908, he discovered the Oxford Cosmopolitan Club, a club formed by Oxford students uh, devoted to the principles of understanding through widening one's horizons that actually was the core idea of cosmopolitan, which is also, I think, in some ways, the essence of the Fulbright idea. But this cosmopolitan club was filled with Oxford students from the British colonies. Uh, bright young men like Azahi Semi, for example, who was his closest friend among the club members, who was from South Africa, who returned to South Africa and founded the African National Congress that played such a prominent role in the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. Through the club also, Locke met Lionel de Fonseca, the Selenese uh, literary intellectual who would write a book critiquing the British decorative taste exemplified by the coronation of Edward VII in 1902. He also met uh, Sakya Mukherjee, a wealthy uh, Brahmin from the Bengali region in India, who was writing on the Bengali novel and really trying to advance a kind of Indian Renaissance and who you know, was doing that despite the remark from Macaulay that all Indian literature was not worth a single shelf of books. These colonial intellectuals from Egypt, India, Ceylon, South Africa, were also joined by radical European intellectuals from Germany, France, Russia, who essentially were critical of the whole British imperial project and who taught Locke to see the American race problem within the larger conceptual frame of the question of imperialism and colonialism. In effect, they taught him to think of race as part of a larger problem of domination uh, on a global scale. But the other part of Locke's remark, he says, uh, uh, leaving for Paris is telling. Feeling isolated and threatening in the no safe space of England, Locke felt on the other hand very much at home in the rest of Europe, especially France and Germany and Italy. And it was on his travels to Italy that he had an awakening. Traveling with Dick Fonseca to Venice, I mean, and to uh, Florence, he wrote to his mother, I really studied the museums, the galleries, and especially the churches soaking up all that Donatello, uh, Michelangelo, and Gernardo could teach him. Florence was the real Renaissance and also a kind of real university for him, more important in some ways than Oxford. He didn't know it then, I think, but Locke was preparing himself to become uh, the Black Lorenzo, whose love of curiosity, experimentation, and art would carry on the work of the Florentine patron. But what seemed to hold Locke's attention the most in Florence were the, quote, the old church frescoes, particularly the Gerlandau frescoes in the Santa Maria novella. Now, when I was writing my first drafts of the biography, I couldn't understand why Locke, a relatively unreligious esthete was so fascinated by these church frescoes. I mean, he wasn't attending church in the United States, you know what I mean? So like, why is he, and of course, over in on my own trip, I realized that actually the churches are the museums, the most important museums, in my opinion, in uh, Italy. So on that Fulbright trip, I had an opportunity to go back to Florence and to look at the frescoes in the Santa Maria novella rather than spending all my time like the tourists uh, gaping at Michelangelo's David. And it was only because I was on that Fulbright that I discovered 
how fascinating it must have been for Locke to look at those huge frescoes and find every once in a while African faces and rotund bodies in the late Gothic frescoes of the Renaissance churches. Evidence that African and Muslim influences uh, in the medieval Europe had survived into the Italian Renaissance. Locke felt more comfortable in Italy, I think, uh, because he could see his own tradition reflected in what was considered the Western civilization. He was a descendant of Africans and he in fact was everywhere. He wasn't actually segregated. He was a world a phenomena. As such, he was not an outsider to Western civilization as some might want him to feel, but someone from a black tradition that had been part of the most storied moment in Western civilization, the European Renaissance. So when Locke was later called on back at Oxford to deliver a paper on uh, cosmopolitanism, the general concept of cosmopolitanism, he revealed a new sense of cosmopolitanism crafted out of the painful experience of his Oxford days, but also the liberating experience of being on the continent as a black man. This new, more pluralistic conception of cosmopolitanism is kind of begins in a way like William James's famous essay on a certain blindness in human beings. For Locke critiqued the typical notion of cosmopolitanism is simply the idea that traveling abroad will enlarge one's horizons. Locke was very skeptical of that after his experience at Oxford. He like it, it enlarged the uh, perspectives, the Rhodes scholars who were hounding him. In fact, as he said, in all the shifting of attention and moving around, the reality is that most of us carry our horizons with us and are able to, unable to see through any other eyes but our own. What was needed, Locke felt, was not the illusion of perspicacity, but the acknowledgement and acceptance of one's own cultural limitations. Only through a heightened sense of the contrast of other people's cultures with one's own could one begin to see what was beneficial and lacking in one's own perspective. That was the real work that cosmopolitanism should do, but it was not the in the usual way in which Americans talk about going abroad. Most thought of that as confirming their prejudices rather than considering, reflecting, interrogating them. Locke's encounter with the British, therefore, had chastened his sense of cosmopolitanism. The British uh, were uh, cosmopolitan, he believed, because they traveled and ruled the world, something his Oxford cosmopolitan colonial friends uh, would teach him. Yes, they were more worldly than the Southern Road Scott, essentially different. But there was a silver line in this experience for those who were considered inferior, the colonial subjects or the Americans like Locke. Locke realized that the falseness of the British model of cosmopolitanism uh, also opened the door to an alternative, one that he and Seme and Mukherjee and Fonseca tried to develop. And it began with realizing the falseness of emulating the British notion of cosmopolitanism, which he found was primarily ethnocentric. Dead, cosmopolitanism gave the colonized, like Locke, quote, very rare opportunity to choose deliberately what I was born, but what the tyranny circumstances prevents many of our folk from ever viewing as the privilege 
an opportunity of being an African-American. And he used that term Afro-American at the time. Here I have the uh, cover of a book by uh, my friend Haki Mabudi, one of the black arts theorists, mainly because of that title, Run Toward Fear. Locke had actually been running away from his fear when he went to Oxford. But now at Oxford, he realized essentially there was no escape. He hadn't really seen it the same way that people who were just trapped in the United States could had see it. But now he realized essentially that I have to be what I was born, but in an expansive way. And I can be expansive at the same time of being African-American. I had been running away, but now he really realized it was pointless to try and lose himself in a smorgasbord of other people's uh, cultures. And instead to begin to interrogate his own tradition, which he'd realized in Italy was more expansive than he had thought. Travel abroad had shown him that his tradition was not limited to America, but was everywhere he went. If he was just able to open his eyes and see it, being Afro-American was not essential. It was part of a Black internationalism that most Afro-Americans never got to see because they were stuck in their own countries fighting racism, economic entrapments, the tyranny of circumstances, as he put it. Ironically, though Americans had been the bane of his existence at Oxford, being at Oxford had led him to appreciate his American identity even more. Though the Rhodes Scholars, uh, Southern Rhodes Scholars sought to deny him the right to be representative of America, he refused to let them take his Americanism away from him. But the conflict and travel also opened up a new perspective, not just for him, uh, but also for his time and perhaps for us. Uh, the transnationalism of his experience returned him to the value of the local, to the indigenous sense of community. A term later on he used to describe Harlem is also appropriate here. Oxford had been a crucible of black and brown uh, cosmopolitans, people from different parts of the world who had come together and created something unique. The question ahead for him and for them would be whether they could outline a path to a new humanism based on the value contrasts of their experience abroad. The answer for him was the Harlem Renaissance, two dissimilar terms, Harlem and Renaissance, that drew together his experience overseas. Now, you know, it would only really be in 1925 when he edited the special Harlem issue of Survey Graphic that Locke would be able to put these feelings together in a form that could be expressed and shared with others, that he could move that next step. The idea of a renaissance that came out of the Black experience of racism, but wasn't limited by it one that advanced a new humanism, a new cosmopolitanism, not hobbled by its attachment to the arrogance and domination that he had seen abroad. Here, Locke would practice this new sense of what I'm calling transnationalism by having a German artist illustrate both the survey graphic uh, which was a special issue, came out in March of 1925, and The New Negro, An Interpretation, a book he published in 1925, uh, uh, because he believed that the vision, the outsider, had something to teach Americans. And of course, you can see right here how much the, the Italian Renaissance with the brown Madonna here is operating in this text. Harlem would become a metaphor 
this new transnational congregation. Northerners, Northerners, West Indians, Africans, Europeans could come together and be embraced. The outsider welcomed into a place where difference was accepted, not just tolerated as Locke had been at Turin. The Fulbright vision of the transformative effect of study abroad, which was sort of the old definition of cosmopolitanism, had been updated by Locke and instilled uh, with his vision of Harlem as the cosmopolitan space in America, but also a space of dialogue with Paris, Berlin, Florence, a diaspora for the new Americanism. In turn, throughout the period of the Harlem Renaissance, Locke would encourage generations of young Black people to go abroad, not simply to enlarge their horizons, but to gain what he had gotten in Europe, a new perspective on what was really important, which inevitably was permission to come home. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Stewart, for setting the scene and providing us all with that historical context. Uh, I'd now like to welcome Dr. Joanne Braxton, who will join Dr. Stewart in conversation and delve even deeper into his book and the life of Alan Locke. Uh, Dr. Braxton is the Francis L. and Edwin L. Cummings Professor of the Humanities Emerita at William and & Mary and a distinguished scholar of African-American literature and culture. She is a former Fulbright professor and the proud mother of a Fulbright daughter. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Joanne Braxton. Thank you, Christopher. And thank you, Dr. Stewart for sharing these profound remarks. Like Jeffrey, I wanna thank our friends at the Fulbright Commission for organizing today's program and for inviting me to be in conversation with my colleague, Dr. Stewart about his prize winning book, The New Negro, The Life of Alan Locke. I am grateful to Dr. Stewart for his remembrance of our teacher and mentor, the late John Blassingame, and also for many other teachers and scholars in our intellectual lineage who are too many to name, but who we remember in our hearts. It is Black History Month. This pouring of libation is the recognition that we too, Jeffrey and I, like Blassingame and Alan Watt, are descendants of African people, some of whom built the White House and the US Capitol, as well as many of the buildings at William and Mary, where I am Professor Emerita. Happy 75th birthday, Fulbright. Thank you for the honor of this day and for all the work of diplomacy and knowledge sharing that Fulbright does and which makes the world a safer place. Happy birthday and many, many happy returns. With respect and in the presence of the ancestors. Dr. Stewart, if I may, for those who may not be familiar with Alan Locke or the Harlem Renaissance movement, I would like to start with the title of your book, which suggests many intertextual relations. I love the way in which you demonstrate Locke's perspective that a Renaissance could come out of the Black experience of racism to advance a new humanism. Your book's title of course, remembers the title of Locke's 1925 volume, which remembers in turn his March 1925 survey graphic essay, same essay appearing uh, 
as the lead of the 1925 volume, same year. Very generative. The title itself, The New Negro, presupposes that in some realm, there must have been an old Negro. For those who are not scholars of this aspect of American literary tradition and who are not familiar with Locke's work, I have a bit to share for the proper contextualization of our conversation today. After which, Dr. Stewart, I will ask you to reflect on these three, on these things. The old Negro, the new Negro, and the transformational inter relationships among the original essay, the volume published in 1925, and the title of your book, which honors Locke's intellectual quest. So here's the quote I have chosen from the 1925 essay. In the last decade, Something beyond the watch and guard of statistics has happened in the life of the American Negro. And the three Norns who have traditionally presided over the Negro problem have a changeling in their laps. The sociologist, the philanthropist, the race leader are not unaware of the new Negro, but they are at a loss to account for him. He simply cannot be swathed in their formula. For the younger generation is vibrant with a new psychology. The new spirit is awake in the masses and under the very eyes of the professional observers is transforming what has been a perennial problem into the progressive phases of contemporary Negro life. Could such a metamorphosis have taken place as suddenly as it has appeared to? The answer is no, not because the new Negro is not here, but because the old Negro had long become more of a myth than a man. Dr. Stewart, for those who are still seeking intellectual grounding in our field, please share your reflections on what Locke called the old Negro Locke's new Negro and the intertextual relationships among these three transformational texts. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Joanne. I mean, it's, uh, it's a conversation that we're still engaged with, I think, that he was trying to intervene in with this term, the new Negro. Of course, the term new Negro had been used by many people, perhaps as early as the late 19th century, to mean a young uh, person who was usually born after slavery and who wanted to define an identity that was not uh, caught in all of the debates about slavery ex-slavery, or as uh, Frederick Douglass said, what is to be done with the Negro, right? That kind of discourse had been quite prevalent in the late 19th century. And essentially, there was a generation born after slavery that essentially did not feel hobbled by those determinations. On the other hand, the media and the sociologists, as we even see today, continue to carry on a narrative about what's wrong with Black people, why can't they adjust, why can't they move on, even ignoring, of course, all of the horrific things that were being done to Black people. They sort of took the circumstances, what Locke called the tyranny of circumstances, and they instilled them in the people and said, it's your problem. So that's what he saw going on and that's what he wanted to draw attention to. Now, the thing about the old Negro, I think it's important where he says, he says, is more of a myth than a man. And I think what he's saying is he's really the first person uh, in American intellectual life to really talk about uh, the Negro as a discursive object 
something that doesn't exist in reality. It's just a discourse. It's a way of talking. And particularly, as he said, it's a way of talking about black people by people who are not black people. That was one of the purposes of the book, The New Negro, that he did in 1925. He said in the foreword is to allow black people to speak for themselves. So that gets to the core idea of the New Negro, which is agency, the ability to be proactive, to, to, to carry out an agenda, to have a vision of what you want your life to be and to pursue it without being distracted by the constant drumbeat of racialism or about black people, black people. I mean, we've had this in the United States all the way since uh, Fred, I mean, uh, Thomas Jefferson in uh, his notes on Virginia in the 1780s. Those black people are this, uh, they sleep a lot, they're not that intelligent. There's a whole uh, uh, really superstructure of opinions about black people that have been layered onto thinking black people and have hobbled them. And I think he was somewhat hobbled with this when he left Harvard and went to Oxford. But what he realized is that the only way to escape this is to basically chart your own path. And I think that's what the new Negro does. Now Locke, I think, was criticized somewhat and legitimately so for thinking that you could just ignore racism and carry out your agenda by ignoring it. He, he felt at times like people were too caught up in answering racist charges. So the new Negro is a little bit of idealized, right? Uh, because we know, and today even, you know, a traffic stop, no matter what your education or background is, can turn into a death sentence, uh, regardless of what you do, okay? So that's one of those tragic circumstances, okay? But I think what he said is, aside from those extreme situations, we have a lot of agency. And so he wanted African-Americans to be proactive as much as was possible. But art and culture was the area where they could be that. There was already a stereotype that Black people were musical and cultural and all that. Why not use that to build a kind of citadel of agency? And I think to a certain extent, although maybe not as self-consciously planned out as Locke wanted it to be, we see some of that today. We see that in the music industry is largely dominated by African-American creatives uh, in hip hop and jazz, uh, in, even in rock and roll. People like Beyonce, others have a, a tremendous amount of cultural influence through the arts and have a certain amount of agency through the arts that perhaps we're still struggling with in the economic and political realm. So that was his idea that the new Negro was there. The sociologists were always saying about what's wrong with you. And he was trying to focus on what's right with you and what can you do to make it even righter. Locke else, elsewhere in his text celebrates the new Negro as a spiritual coming of age. You've mentioned that he wasn't a religious man. What does aesthetics and the emergence of the new Negro in literature and the arts have to do with spirituality? Or put another way, what does spirituality have to do with the emergence of the new Negro in literature and the arts? Yes, well, you see a bunch of people often in the modernists who are somewhat alienated from the strictures of the church and the church tradition uh, and the role perhaps that black ministers played in black life, which of course, you know, is, is a contested space uh, and try to find in art an alternative spiritual zone. And in some ways that zone takes back to the African traditions, which you were foregrounding in the libations. Locke thought that that, that African spirituality that sort of predated our 
uh, conversion to Christianity needed to be reclaimed. Not so much that we could go back to that, but we could incorporate more of that in our daily life through the arts. Okay, we all know that in Africa, art is not a separated terrain whereby, you know, you just put African sculpture in a museum or put uh, uh, paintings up on the wall. It's part of the spiritual life of the whole community. And so he wanted white people in the United States to reclaim some of that. And, and part of that he focused on was the spirituals themselves religious songs that the enslaved had created uh, during the harshest days of 19th century slavery. He says, look at this, in the worst of circumstances, Black people created a whole new uh, musical form that in many ways, he argued, communicated the religiosity of the Old and New Testaments more powerfully uh, than the, the, the white Christians in uh, the United States. In fact, over time, even now, we see that if you visit certain white churches in the South, the form of the presentation, the style of talking, the singing of music is very much influenced uh, by uh, a Black spiritual religious traditions. So the spirituals were well named they were an artistic form that conveyed a kind of sense of transcendence, a sense of oneness that we all have, but without forcing us all to be alike. I think that was the thing that Locke was most concerned about. We can be spiritual, we can be united, but we don't all have to be alike. And if we can accept difference, that actually then shows how spiritual we really are. Thank you. I have a couple more questions for you and we have some questions in the chat box. I will try to keep my questions short or shorten them a bit so that we will have adequate time for a shared discourse. But um, I'd like to um, go back to a moment to your representation of Locke's experiences as a member of the Cosmopolitan Club at Oxford and um, the way in which he was influenced by his friends there who taught him what you called a larger conceptual framework from, from which to criticize racism as not unique the experience of black people in America, but as part of a global system of domination. Could you say a bit more about the various experiences at home and abroad that have that taught Locke to see the American race problem as a colonial problem? And do you agree with that analysis? Also, um, is there a sense in which uh, Locke's view of the emergent Black arts movement of his day, in which he played such a seminal role, is a reflection of his experience in the Cosmopolitan Club? Yes, so I think um, one of the things that is kind of interesting about this Oxford experience is that he's sort of hounded by these Southern Road scholars, but he identifies the source of their problem in the British. In other words, as he later called, there's a kind of Anglo-American partnership around race. Uh, so I think being in dialogue with people from India and from Egypt and from South Africa, all places that were also under this British imperialist uh, regime helped him to have a comparative view of racism. See, that's the key is that going abroad allowed him to compare his situation in conversation with theirs. So he had already done a little of that before, but it became much more powerful. What is, you know, because in South Africa, basically, you're having a system being put together of apartheid. Not that different. I mean, it is different in many ways, but the structural idea of having spatial separation between different races is the same. Uh, that seems to have something to do with uh, a, a certain mindset that's not just in America. Uh, in India, he was very much interested in uh, how the 
British came in and essentially created uh, an intellectual core of people who would espouse British values in Indian schools, right? Sort of teach them to worship the British. And he saw that as going on in the United States. So these were some lessons, let's say. Now, the key thing, though, is how do we get out of this? One approach is, of course, to just go along with it, right? Which was no longer tenable for him uh, once he had been stung with the way in which they refused to allow him, you see? Uh, they refused to let him be part of it. That was one distinctive thing about the Americans. The, 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 the British were allowed a couple of Indian geniuses to come in so they could go back and carry on their work. But that level of, say, sophistication, if you want to call it, uh, wasn't available to him. So he had a starker reminder that I'm an outsider, okay? And the desire that some people did is say, okay, I'm going to do to them what they're doing to us. This is uh, actually quite natural reaction, right? But he said, no, that's not going to work either because then I'll just reproduce the same sort of things. So is there a way in this spiritual quality that Black people had developed as a kind of compensation in their art that could be a way out? So that's when he came up with the idea that art was a form of catharsis, that through the engagement of art, and, and art that didn't run away from being Black, but engaged Blackness through the art, that there could be a kind of internal transition that would liberate you from the worst psychological effects of racism. And in a sense, that was a larger project, not just for Black people, that in a way, white people in America needed a cathartic art as well. And that the path to a humanism where maybe people could come together and sort of talk about and do this cathartic work could be in the arts. Now, of course, obviously we know there are counterexamples of that. Uh, art can be uh, a, a commercial project. Uh, we see in the 1920s and 30s how some of the most brilliant projects and products of the black experience like jazz and swing are co-opted by whites. Nevertheless, Locke would say, yes, but maybe that art form is still doing a kind of humanizing work, even when it's co-opted. You see, is there a deeper level of the work of African forms carrying out in America than we can actually see and feel when we're so caught up with reacting to what they are saying about us? So there's embedded, I think, in what you're asking is a certain spiritual maturity that is required for us to see it in his way and to have that faith in the midst of, and in the face of so many counterexamples, you know, of uh, being demonized and oppressed. So that was the kind of work he thought the arts could do and potentially maybe are doing now. If you look at something like, for example, the tremendous embrace, which to me has been somewhat astounding, of hip hop by young whites, right? You know, which you wouldn't normally think of. You know, people talking about growing up in the Bronx and, you know, not having any food and, and, and struggling to survive and yet some other people embracing that. Maybe it's trivialized, maybe it's uh, uh, misunderstood, uh, but something in there doing a kind of work, and particularly with hip hop, being a worldwide phenomenon, people all over the world. You see, that's a kind of work that the art is doing that I think he would probably criticize in some ways. It's not high art, but it is still doing a kind of work that could be liberating and at times cathartic. Thank you, thank you. And uh, Fulbright, I beg your indulgence for one more question. It's so rare and so important when minoritized scholars get to have this kind of dialogue in the public sphere. This is my last question, which is complicated. 
I wish to inquire into the question of whether, and if yes, how, Locke's conceptual framework for analysis has merit for our understanding of American race relations. And further, whether this conceptual framework has implications for international educational and research exchanges today. Through yes. our school writers. Let me just give a short quote. He wrote, yeah. the fiction is that the life of the races is separate and increasingly so. The fact is that we have touched too closely at the unfavorable levels and too lightly at the favorable levels. He also wrote, subtly the conditions that are molding a new Negro are molding a new American attitude. However, this new phase of things is delicate. It will call for less charity and more justice, less help, but infinitely closer understanding. What do you suppose did Locke mean by this and how should we deliberate on his observation for the compassionate advancement of American diplomacy at a time when every country in the world is looking to our America to see how we will address systemic inequality and to resolve threats to our American democracy. To reiterate, does his conceptual framework for analysis have merit for our understanding of American race relations and its further implications for international educational and research exchanges today? Is there a medicine to be distilled from the narrative of his intentional but often difficult life? Yes, well, I think that's, I'd say yes. Uh, you know, reading that uh, answer there where he says it's delicate, you see, that's in a sense, I'm reminded of uh, something that Michelle Alexander wrote in an op-ed in the New York Times where she said, we are not the resistance. And what she was responding to uh, earlier in the uh, Trump administration was the uh, attitude among some that we were gonna mount a resistance to Trump or whomever we were feeling was not agreeing with us. And she said, you know, we're not the resistance. In fact, we are the coming age. Other people are the resistors. And if that, just that shift in perspective is what I think Locke would have applied. You see, not looking at it as you're resisting something, but you are the coming of age, the coming of age of the American idea, which has always been flawed, but is in a kind of work in progress and not to be discouraged by that. It's almost as if the American race situation is a laboratory in which experiments are being carried out that are useful for the rest of the world. It's just that our experiments tend to be so uh, catastrophic at time in their results that you know we are often burned and chastened uh, by what happens nevertheless. It is this working out of the idea. Can we be truly cosmopolitan or can we truly accept other people in their difference and yet call them our brothers and our sisters? That's the struggle. And that's the struggle that he was involved in. And his main thing was to be distracted by the resistance, you see? That's the whole spiritual uh, uh, part of it. How do we stay to course when there's so many people trying to drive us off course? Locke didn't get his uh, degree from Oxford, but he got an education from the others because he realized he was not alone in being a super educated uh, uh colonial subject. I mean, I do think the colonial metaphor sometimes doesn't work that well for the United States. I do think, though, that what he saw is that the colonized have a culture, even if 
the work of colonialism is to erase it and make you dependent. Because as he said in his book on race contacts, he says, you know, the point of erasing the culture of the colonized is so that the Indian or the Egyptian will buy British cotton. There's an economic basis behind why the ratio of indigenous and, and, and alternative cultures exist. And once you aware that, then you say, oh, okay, that's what that is. That kind of is freeing. So, you know, Locke had really a kind of radical side to him that is, uh, you know, underappreciated in the sense that, you know, once you begin to free yourself from being brainwashed by these various uh, uh, regimes, you can then begin to chart uh, a independence. Even if you do not control the country you're in, you can carry out an independent path to agency. And I think that's the most important thing that we can gain from him. Thank you so much, Dr. Stewart. We have a few questions in the Q&A. Are you able to tap into the Q&A directly? Uh, let me see here. Yes, uh-huh, yes. Would you like to answer uh, one or more sure. questions? Sure, okay, sure, yes. One of them is, I don't know if I'll get them in the right uh, order, but uh, one from Charles Nero. Could you talk more about the role that Locke's sexuality played in his ability to come back to America and resist the heteronormativity he found among leading Black American intellectuals? How important was Europe for the development of Locke's ideas about uh, uh, sexuality? Yes, I think this is a very important aspect of, say, kind of unexpressed in addition to escaping from American racism, he was also trying to escape from American homophobia. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, he was able to live a much freer life as a gay man when he was in the United States, when he was in abroad. One of the things about it, though, is that he could not earn a living abroad, right? He recognized that he had hoped in a way early on, actually considering this, uh, context here. He'd hope to be a diplomat, right? And then he could live the diplomatic life, you know, being in one place for a while. And then, but that wasn't happening because essentially uh, he was still a Black subject in the world scene. He found, in fact, that the only group of people who would support him as a professional in the world at that time were Black people in the United States. This profound thing <laughs> that he come to grips with. So then he would have to come back. You know, when he came back in 1911, he was almost penniless. And he started lecturing on the Negro in a race tradition. He got a job at Howard University. And it's possible that he was marginalized at Howard University because of his sexuality. But at the same time, that forced upon him uh, the need to live a closeted life. And in many ways, I think he suffered a great deal because of that. But the way around that is he would go away to Europe almost every summer. And so he kind of compartmentalized and segregated his life to a certain extent uh, because that was really the regime both sexually and racially in the early part of uh, the, uh, the 20th century. I do believe, though, that his success as becoming a professor, of, he came back and got a PhD from uh, Harvard, he became the, the originator or at least the spokesperson for the Harlem Renaissance, and the Harlem Renaissance becoming a place of tolerance for uh, uh, queer sexuality allowed him to create a space for others who would actually be freer in their confrontation and acceptance of their sexuality than he did. So sometimes the person can only carry on uh, the evolution that they can carry on, right? Uh, he really created a space for others. He was almost like a, a curator uh, rather than an artist, creating opportunities for others to take advantage of things that uh, 
that uh, that he couldn't. Unfortunately, some of those people wanted to go back to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, but uh, I think after uh, the experience with uh, Locke, uh, Rhodes didn't see its way clear to uh, to allow any of the young men that he promoted to go, like County Cullen, for example, the great poet of the Harlem Renaissance wanted to become a Rhodes Scholar, and uh, but the, the door was closed after Locke. Please, uh, there were a number of questions about Locke's uh, sexuality in the um, in the Q and A. Um, yes. Would you share, please, some of the conversation that we had at a more leisurely pace about the challenges you faced in whether uh, to write about Locke's sexuality at all? and the determining yes. factors that made it a possibility for you to be transparent in a way that you might not have been able to be if you had been publishing this book 20 years earlier as you might well have done. Yes, well, this is, the, <laughs> this is one of the saving graces, as Locke would put it, of having spent, you know, half of my life or more on this book, right? Is that if I had published it earlier, I would have published it in a different context, you know, because after all, you know, uh, I was working, when I was working on this book in the eighties uh, because I interviewed some of the people and I went to Howard and whatever, uh, various people who were friends of mine and colleagues, uh, one in particular said to me at one point, you know, maybe you shouldn't write about his sexuality at all. And, you know, at that time I was wrestling because uh, when Blasting Game first introduced me to the topic, he uh, didn't know that Locke was gay. And then when I came back many years later, I said, did you know Locke was gay? He said, yeah, that makes it interesting. I said, well, yeah, thanks for, thanks for giving a heads up, brother. <laughs> you know, but, um, you know, I was wrestling with form at the same time. So I was wrestling with how do you, I wasn't a, I was wrestling with biographer. And then how do you sort and interplay different aspects of Locke's life? Uh, uh, his sexuality was one of them. His attitudes on race were relatively unusual. His attitudes on art as an emancipatory platform, that was unusual. How do you balance these? And many times people said, don't deal with it, but I couldn't find a way around it. Uh, in other words, even if I had wanted to, I couldn't because it was intrinsic to who he was. I also had the experience of encountering people because I would always go back to Howard and you know work on it and go back of people who wanted to just look at Locke only as a gay subject and uh, encountered them and they were working on it and they had difficulty because then they couldn't deal with the, the racial dynamics, or at least they didn't. Maybe they not question that they couldn't, but they weren't able to. So the change in context, particularly moving from the 80s, uh, the whole AIDS epidemic, which you know tended to problematize, but also I think humanize uh, the struggles of, of queer communities, uh, particularly in the 90s. I think the 90s was a transitional period and also the publication of a couple of brave books. One of them uh, by uh, my, my my friend and and uh, kind of later mentor, uh, David Levering Lewis, who wrote that very important book, When Harlem Was in Vogue, which was the first book that really established that it wasn't just that one person or another was gay, but that there was a gay through line through the story of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, uh, because many people would publish on the Harlem Renaissance and wouldn't even mention uh, people's uh, uh, personal lives at all. It was just that they were a race man doing race work. That whole regime itself made it difficult because what the person who advised me against talking about it said, well, if you bring that up, that'll take over and that'll be the whole story. That was the feeling uh, early on. But I said, well, that's possible. But if it is, if that does happen, that's then a sign of my failure as a biographer. So that's why the, 
the the issue of biography is so important here because you have to really be able to empathize and you know to see the person struggling and trying to fit themselves into a system that doesn't necessarily want them uh, but at the same time remain themselves so Locke was a flawed messenger of uh like say late 20th century uh, identity politics, but he was struggling with it. And I felt like if I make that struggle visible and audible in the text, that was really all I had to do. I didn't have to solve Locke's problem. That's another thing is that you get into as a biographer, you, you want to resolve conflicts. And it's much, I came to a point where I just would sit with those conflicts and let them have voice rather than imposing uh, uh, my uh, agenda on them. So I think that's another part of this whole story that he was talking about with the new Negro. Let the Negro speak for himself. I tried as much as possible to Locke speak for himself. Ashe. So we have one more question in the uh, Q&A, but I do think we have to um, move on. Thank you, Bill Timpson, for your question. If you will forward that to Mr. Mazakan at Fulbright, we will make sure that both Dr. Stewart and I uh, attempt to answer that question. And Jeffrey, it's been a joy. Well, thank you, Joanne. It has been for me. See you again. Thank you. Thank you both very much for joining us and allowing us to be a part of that conversation. Um, we're honored that you were able to participate in this event today and have these important conversations with us at the Fulbright Program. I would like to uh, just draw everyone in the audience, I'd like to draw your attention to some upcoming Fulbright at 75 events. Uh, we will be uh, having another one on Thursday, March 8th at 6 p.m., um, which is an evening of poetry, which will include a special reading by Fulbrighter and poet Rita Dove. You can find more information about these events at Fulbright75.org, and we also encourage you to sign up for the newsletter. Thank you all for joining us today, and we hope to see you at another Fulbright at 75 event. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much.